Hello, can you all hear me? Oh, um, I teach at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And um, when people ask me what I teach, I say, well, I teach the sculpture department. I teach in the museum, ex museum education department. I've been a curator. I teach in the, the art history theory and criticism department. And they look at me like I'm some sort of schizophrenic. Um, because academia, of course, is very discipline-based. Um, and of course, in all of this, I should say, I have my master's, my graduate training as a painter, the one department I don't teach in <laughs> at the school. Um, and when they asked me to do this talk, I started thinking about, OK, what do I want to talk about? How do I want to frame this? Because, um, and it occurred to me that maybe what I should talk about is this constant struggle within my own life to make the different parts of my creative, the different aspects of my creative interests rub up against one another in productive ways. Because it is really a constant struggle. I started my career as a museum educator. And um, in, I, as I said, I've been a curator, I teach, um, I'm an artist, I'm a researcher. And so I started thinking about, you know, I, and, and what's odd is you see me standing here with a, piece of, with a bunch of pieces of paper. Um, I, my students, if any of them are watching, um, know that I never teach with notes. And like most of us in academia, and certainly most artists, I've presented my work and, you know, have slides move on, and I know what um, to say because I know what I'm looking at because I made it. <laughs> but I decided um, for a variety of reasons that will become apparent as I go on that when I s was invited to do this um, partly because I'm a bit of a contrarian, I decided that I would write an essay and perform an essay for you. So please bear with me because this is sort of um, kind of new. <laughs> When I began to think about this talk and the theme of revolution, the perhaps predictable associations of political unrest or technological breakthroughs or new and innovative ways of depicting the world sprang to mind. But I was also reminded of the lines by T.S. Eliot, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. So I want to give you some, oh, this has started already. I wanted to give you some images of the word, a word with a related etymology to revolution, and that is to revolve. Um, imagine a bicycle wheel, we had Cliff talk earlier, um, churning the dust of the road, carrying with it the material evidence of its journey forward onto its forward path. I always tell my students there is no job description for being an artist. There's certainly no entrance exam or board requirement. But that was not always the case. Um, for many years, if you wanted to be an artist, you had to go through the guild system. You would start as an apprentice and you would do very lowly work and work your way up, achieving competency. When you got to a certain level, you could then become a journeyman. And at that point, you would journey surprisingly, you would journey to other towns um, and work for other masters, acquiring other types of competencies. Now, in the process, you would spread ideas. You would figure out how to take what you knew from one place and translate it and transform the practice of another place. And I realize that I am much more interested in the journeymen, the ones who don't know everything, and yet who are brave enough to share what it is they do know. And it seems to me that this position of not knowing, and yet this willingness to share, is critical to the development of knowledge. So finally, after much practice, a journeyman could become a master. And you demonstrated this mastery by making a masterpiece or a master work. That's where we get that word. Presumably then, once you achieved that, you knew exactly how to proceed, what to do. Everyone understood what an artist was and what an artist did because we knew the products that they made. 
Eventually, the guilds were replaced by academies. Whoop, sorry. <laughs> but there was still widespread consensus about what an artist did or what an artist was. But by the 20th century, everything began to change. All bets are off. I could talk to you about Duchamp, but I won't. Um, and the end of the 20th century is where my personal journeywoman's work began. Um, it was a situation in which there were artists who, who exhibited objects, but the objects were not things that they made themselves. I'm thinking, for example, of someone like Jeff Koons, or someone like Jenny Holzer, whose works, whose labors were semantic and conceptual, and whose products were ephemeral and immaterial. But of course, there were many artists who were fully engaged in the craft and making traditions of their respective media. So at the beginning of the 21st century, what is the position and role of the artist? What good are we? What sort of authority do we have? What sort of permissions can we claim? I was at a conference a few months ago, and a fellow panelist was talking about categories, the domains that knowledge is divided into. According to him, science asks, what is this? And economics asks, what is its exchange value? I could add that an artist asks, what might I do with that knowledge? What are its implications? And what does it mean? So as I said, I was trained as a painter. The typical postgraduate ambition was to make a bunch of paintings and sell them in a gallery, preferably in New York. But I was just not attracted to that model. I found myself longing to have conversations with people that were outside of my own conversation. So I spent some time with my family while figuring out what to do next. Now, the family I grew up in was, I suspect, like a lot of American families, um, in that we did not talk about books or philosophy at the dinner table, but we were taken to the public library every week. My parents didn't know a lot about art, but they did take us to the museum and read every label. In short, they were smart, curious people uh, who valued the things that a library museum could offer, but who did not live their lives within them. There are also people who would express their opinion if an artwork seemed to them empty or condescending. I discovered that despite my education, I could understand and even sympathize with their views. Compared with some of my artist friends who were reading art forum, very plugged into the next big thing, keeping an eye on what every gallery was showing everywhere. Part of me remained deeply skeptical of that as a role for an artist. I realized that along with my insider's passion, I could articulate an outsider's doubts. This dual thinking, skepticism and fascination, is part of my habit of mind. And I realized it was something that I was adopting as a role for an artist. I realized that one of the stakes that a skeptical artist like me could lay claim to was the cultural permission to ask provocative questions, including the permission to interrogate the power structures that artists themselves were supported by. But how could I myself locate myself, my art, my creative ambitions, my, my thinking, my research? How could I locate myself in this? I was constantly struggling and am constantly struggling to find a way to knit together my interests, my research, my teaching, my expert, non-expertness, and to bring these aspects of, of my life, of my, all my pursuits, into productive as opposed to debilitating tension. So the images that are, are, are flashing behind me, in fact, this is a perfect place to pause right here, um, are from a series of projects that I conceived about five years ago called Excavating History. These projects take the form of exhibitions, teaching, and uh, recently a released book um, done in historic sites. They began, the first one I did was in an 1801 anatomical theater in Estonia. I've done them in the forest where Goethe wrote. I've done them at the Jane Addams Hull House Museum here in Chicago. In fact, that's what you're looking at right now. Um, so um, just give you a little bit of background on these. Typically, they occur in locations where different communities overlap and learn from one another and are constructed in ways that make the site complicit with the artwork and the artist 
to, to explore the meaning and to generate new meanings in these sites. They begin with research into overlooked histories and cherished myths, uncovering stories that aren't included in the official interpretation. Excavating history projects are driven by the conviction that meanings buried in these sites can be used to inspire alternate futures. After doing several of these as solo exhibitions, I decided that this made perfect, there were so many stories embedded in these sites that collaboration, this was a perfect site for collaboration. So I talked my employer into allowing me to teach this as a class and to also bring students in to these sites. This was one that we did a couple years ago at the Jane Addams Hull House. So this is a, a kind of just to give you an idea of what these things might look like. In the, the Hull House, many of you may not know, was actually where the prototypes for Fiesta Ware came from. Um, Jane Addams, brilliant social reformer, when immigrants from Mexico started to flood into the 19th Ward, where she had earlier worked with immigrants from Eastern Europe, she realized that these people had skills as ceramic artist, and so she instituted a ceramic studio. You need to know that knowledge to understand this piece. You also need to know that Jane Addams put out the call all over for people to come from all over the world to live there and do whatever it was they could do, including picking up trash. Anything that you could do, any way you could serve, you were welcome. So educated people, especially women, because there weren't a lot of places for them to go, would come to Hull House. It was where public, public health and the profession of social work were invented. So Jane Addams had these residents come and live with her, and she had the ceramic studio, and she also had one of the parlors in her room they had recently discovered by doing paint sampling, the parlor where a lot of the residents would gather had originally been painted a terracotta color. So what I did is in this living room, I lined the entire room with panels of soft terracotta clay, oil-based, so it would stay soft. It was not a simple thing to install these panels in such a way that would not in any way affect this historic home. I called it fingerprint by fingerprint. The entire room was covered with clay that stayed soft, and as people went through, they were able to continue the Hull House tradition of leaving their mark by quite physically imprinting the clay through the course of the exhibition. So retrospectively, after doing this for a few years, I realized why this sort of work has become so important to me. It integrates. It leaves room for stories and interpretations to revolve and to come round again in moments they are newly resonant. I'm attracted to it because I can bring to bear my understanding of institutional imperatives and my criticality of them, my teaching and research and making, and create work that is simultaneously political and poetic. History is a narrative discipline. It uses stories to tell why something happened, why it was important. Perhaps that's why in the midst of an excavating history project, the urge to, of all things, write fiction grabbed me by the throat. So I'm already doing museum work and teaching all this stuff, and then suddenly I decided I wanted to write fiction. I guess I just don't get enough rejection as an artist, so I had to add one more thing to the list. So, which meant that as a person pursuing this very hybrid practice, I had to figure out a way to integrate this new interest into my creative life and learn another form of expression. Fortunately, I've been blessed with two brilliant collaborators. Um, uh, an artist, a, a writer, an activist named Kristen Ginger, and Amber Ginsberg, a fellow artist who also teaches here at the UFC. Over many coffee and carbohydrate fuel discussions, Amber and Kristen and I invented yoyomagazine.org, which is an online journal. We wanted to create a structure that mimics the way artists and writers influence one another, and that also mimics conversation. It's self-consciously interested in the way art and writing can produce social relations. So the structure is as follows. Each issue is a, it contains two parts around a broadly conceived theme. The co-editors have a conversation around that theme that's very wide ranging. It is edited down to about a two minute audio clip and pasted on the website. Then we invite people to respond to our conversation and the theme and to send us writing, art, research, photo essays. All of those things we curate into part one. Part one itself is a call to response to the whole web 
for, par for responses to their responses to our conversation, hence the term yo-yo. And this may shock you, but the, uh, the theme for our new issue is revolution. Big surprise. When we brainstormed different um, modifiers placed in front of that word, of course, we had green, French, American, sexual, technological, et cetera, et cetera. And we talked about the verb to revolve. Not long ago, my husband and I were at the opera. And every note this, uh, this soprano sang was just perfect and nuanced and round and just hung in the air of this enormous auditorium song without microphones, and in front of her, dancers just spun across the stage. It was entirely obvious how strenuous their performance was and how perfectly trained they were to do it. During the applause, I turned to my husband and said, that's what happens when human beings do one thing for 20 years. They get really, really good at it. And of course, being insecure, I thought, oh my god, you know, maybe I should just do one thing, just one thing, and I get really good at it thinking of that long ago person making their masterwork, proving their mastery to the whole world. But in my career, that sort of discipline-based, very focused pursuit is not what I ha the way I have answered the question, what good is an artist for? Nonetheless, my way of being an artist also has precedent in that long ago guild system, in the role of the journeyman the wasn't one who wasn't quite the expert yet, figuring out how to translate what he did know from one place to make it relevant to someplace else, bridging territories, cross-pollinating, because that's what yo-yo and excavating history does. The term revolution has a martial ring, as does another term usually associated with art movements, the avant-garde. Noah Feldman mentioned vanguard. They have the same root. We forget that the avant-garde is likewise a military term. One of the things that revolutions share with avant-garde art movements is a tendency to generate manifestos, declarations infused with a sort of absolute aggressive certainty. Given changes in the art of the past century, I think many of us distrust the idea of the avant-garde and are skeptical of such overwhelming confidence. For myself, I'm much more interested in what happens after the avant-gardists or the revolutionaries move on and leave the field. It strikes me that that's when things get really interesting and when really important things begin to occur. Because without finding creative ways to integrate and embed new approaches and revolutionary ideas into our habits of mind, as well as social structures, any revolution risks becoming merely a moment, not a real revolution at all. Wheels go backward and forward over the same ground. And while we need revolutionaries who blaze ahead, we also need integrators who can go back and forth, circulating, which is another form of revolving. Because we tend to think that, bang, a revolution happens and afterwards things are irrevocably changed. Doubts and dual identities vanish. People are on one side or the other, winners, losers, liberators, oppressors. But embracing that dialectic risks that the stakeholders and owners of the revolution, the innovators or technologists or activists or artists, talk only to one another and forget that the people not privy to their conversation, the folks who knew the revolution only as a distant lightning strike, need to be attended to. Here's another thing I say to my students all the time. We make the road by walking it. This implies a slower, more deliberative course of action one that takes time and effort and attention to the ground we're standing on, as well as the road ahead. It sounds a lot less dramatic and maybe less exciting than revolution. But unless we do this integrative, questioning, meaning-making work, both internal and institutional, we risk all of our revolutions becoming merely noisy spectacles sputtering along by the side of the same old road. Thank you. <laughs>